नमस्कार वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू थैंक यू आई एम डॉक्टर गौतम चटर्जी प्रिंसिपल ऑफ हेतमपुर के सी कॉलेज थैंक्स डॉक्टर सैकत साहू फॉर गिविंग मी दिस प्लैटफॉर्म थैंक्स आई क्यू सी कॉर्डिनेटर डॉक्टर पल्लभ ज्योति पाल एंड अवर डीबीटी कन्वेनर डॉक्टर श्यामल कुमार जॉस फॉर देयर काइंड कॉपरेशन एंड सिंसियर सिंसियरनेस about this program not only for this program they are involved in every program we are nothing without them i would like to express my love and sincere greet to dr shati shah and all members and professors associated with botany department non teaching staff for their kind cooperation and support it is my great pleasure to have opportunity to meet all of you in this regard i would take a privilege to thank organizing committee for such great initiation i would to like to thank to wish and express my gratitude to respected resource person dr debrabot allaha and dr moumita bandapadhaya sir and ma'am we are very much pleased that both of you give us a time from your valuable time we are very much thankful to all of you for your kind presence here all students all non teaching staff all teaching staff of other colleges and our botany department has established as distinct department in college i feel very proud for this department for their faculty for their various activity for their result on behalf of kc college on behalf of our governing body i welcome to all of you in our college and hope your seminar is must be fruitful and have a good day to all of you namaskar thank you so much sir uh, we now request our iqsc coordinator dr pallav jyoti pal uh, to say few words please sir thank you thank you shoykat uh, thank you shathi and other organizing teachers of department of botany for organizing such an interesting webinar today and thank you to our respected principal sir for your nice welcome speech i also extend my thanks to uh, shamul kumar josh my friend the dvt coordinator of this college uh, as you all know that department of mathematics physics chemistry and geology has received the prestigious dvt fund from uh, dvt government of india on behalf of iqsc of krishna chandra college i want to extend a warm welcome to all my participants the students also those who are participating uh, without their participation this type of program cannot be cannot be uh, fruitful because all efforts taken by department of botany i know uh, they have taken an enormous uh, uh, thinking over this program uh, we are delighted that all participants will must will uh, enjoy a lot during the session uh, we have today the eminent resource persons uh, for this program i would like to convey my sincere gratitude to them hope all the sessions will be learning sessions uh, we hope to see you sir again uh, in some physical mode of interaction in future due to covid we are, it is not possible for us we are going for webinar but in some day the situation will be handled over and physical mode of interaction will must be possible uh, in future uh, session will start in few minutes i hope that uh, there are some uh, good takeaways for the participants from this webinar which definitely help them in teaching learning in uh, getting uh, knowledge and in also research thank you thank you shoykat thank you department of botany for giving me the opportunity to present a note uh, 
thank you thank you shakar uh, thank you so much dr pal uh, now i am requesting uh, dr saha sati saha a head of the department of botany kishor uh, chandra college to introduce us about today's event am i audible shukar yes 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 you are, you are. good morning everyone on behalf of krishna chandra college i cordially welcome our chief patron and honorable president of our governing body mr chandra bauri our vice patron and respected principal dr gautam chatterjee distinguished delegates participants colleagues and students i want to convey my heartfelt gratitude to both the speaker dr momita bondopadhyay and devabroto laha for accepting our invitation and taking part as invited speakers for this national webinar organized by krishna chandra college entitled exploring the recent advances in plant science we believe that the major three challenges for human kind in the 21st century are food energy and the environment plant life plays an essential role in all these three domains all of our food and the majority of our energy are produced by photosynthetic plants plants are major players in determining our climate also if we want to make head in understanding how this green organisms function and build the foundation for a more sustainable future then we need to apply the most advanced technologies available to the study of plant life so research on plant is needed to gather knowledge in every aspect of plant life today we have two eminent speakers who will deliver lectures on very interesting and modern aspects of plant life at first dr devabroto laha from isc bangalore will talk about a plant signaling molecule called inositol phosphate that helps plant to react according to the environmental and then dr momita bondopadhyay from department of botany university of calcutta will tells about the autophagy in plant that can either promote or restrict different forms of program cell death hope all of you will enjoy and be enriched academically now i request mr shahu please go forward Thank you so much, so much, Dr. Shaha. Uh, now we will turn the time over to the speakers. I am uh, requesting one of our enthusiastic colleagues, uh, Mrs. Shamakti Thakur, to address our first speaker, Dr. Devor Bruto Laha. Uh, please, Shamakti Thakur. Hello. Yes, yes. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. thank you hello a very good day to everyone my heartiest congratulations to my colleagues ipsc coordinators and our principals to organize this type of uh, this type of a lot of um, sorry sorry i have some network problem hello yes 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 please continue my heartiest congratulations to my colleagues for doing something positive in this unsuspected covid-19 situation it is my great pleasure and my great privilege to get an opportunity to introduce our first speaker dr devabroto laha he is the assistant professor of department of biochemistry at institute of science in bangalore the subject botany he has got his bsc degree in 2007 and msc in the year 2009 from bisvarthi university then he has awarded with the prestigious that scholarship and three lire in the university of tubingen at germany for his phd work from 2010 to 
in the subject area molecular plant physiology his main focus was a plant signaling molecule inositol phosphate which provides a unique type of cellular language that plants use in intracellular communication and in responding to change in their environment after completing his phd degree from germany he had worked as postdoctoral research fellow in the university of bonn at germany from 2017 to 18 and then as a postdoctoral research associate in the thomas mrc laboratory for molecular cell biology in uk from 2018 to 20 he has several golden opportunity there in the abroad but it is our good fortune that he has joined as an assistant professor in our um, in our india and in our um, country in the department of biochemistry in indian institute of science at bangalore during covid 19 situation at 2020 till that he has attended several numbers of research and several numbers of national and international conference seminars and symposium all around the globe he has published more than 10 research papers in the world uh, which is like proceedings of the cell and um, proceedings of the national academy of science plant physiology the plant cell molecular plant nature communications and many more he has won several prestigious awards like the scholarship from germany young scientist awards has prize by indian society of plant physiology in india rain hold and maria tutiel prize for outstanding phd thesis for uh, from sicilian and germany and dhg international post doctoral research fellowship for mrc lncd at london and it is a proud moment that recently in this year he has got his prestigious hardogin khurana innovative young biotechnologist award i in behalf of department of botany krishna chandra college congress you sir and conde our heartiest well wishes for the future It's a great pleasure to get you today among us. Today, Dr. Laha will deliver a talk on the topic entitled as "Inositol Pyrophosphate: A Novel Class of Signaling Molecules at the Interface Between Plant Growth and Immunity." Now, I request Dr. Devendra to Laha. Please, sir, continue. Thank you. Please, uh, Dr. Laha. Now it's your time. Thank you very much. It's such a nice, you know, and very kind introduction. And uh, let me start with uh, thanking, you know, Shathi and uh, also the Department of Botany and uh, of of Krishna Chandra College and Shaikat and uh, all of you for the, for the nice invitation. And I'm very much delighted to be part of this, you know, uh, this this uh, national webinar on plant science. Um, and uh, I I also thank you know Samapti again for very for her very kind word and going through all of my CV. and uh, so yeah thank you very much i'm i'm very much happy to be to be part of this uh, web webinar um so before i start my presentation i just say you no know, those those the, all the students you know uh, if you want to ask me any question irrespective of language in bengali english or hindi i can speak all these three languages so whatever you want you can ask me any time okay so do, please do not uh, hesitate it is important that you know you get into this topic and 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 uh, you, you understand what i tell okay So maybe I try. I never use this Google Meet platform, but I think it should work somehow. So let's see. And, uh, uh, you just go to the present now option. Yeah, and then you must grant permission to screen share. Screen share. And then select a screen. uh somehow the permission is not granted actually so i don't know how to do now what let me check one thing actually so mm. Now, uh, Shoykat, if you are hosting the meeting, you have to make him the co-host, or else he won't be able to present. Okay, okay, yes. Sir. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's the, that's the reason actually. Yeah, I think so. Uh, please, sir, go to the play present now option.
Uh, I, I still can't share anything. Uh, just uh, click on the present now option. Uh, then go to the your entire no, team. You have, to, you have to make me co-host as uh, you know, Mohamed. So because he cannot present because you are the host of the meeting. Only you can present. Okay, okay, okay. So okay. you have to make him the co-host, okay, okay. and then he can present. Please sir. So I guess what you need to do, you have to go to participant and then you have to select my name and then you have to allow me to co-host. Okay. And you can click there, you know, in, in, yeah. There is no option, just there is two options, pin print to screen and remove from meeting. Can the other speaker try whether she can uh, share her, her screen? Uh, I'm trying. Shrikot, can you click on my name? Is it possible? Yes, just... yes, yes, yes. Or maybe right click, I don't know. Can you see my screen? I was sharing my screen. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, actually, okay. I can see your screen, but uh, so then it's problem on mine. Yeah, so I'm stopping presenting. Okay, so I'm present now. Actually, I, I leave the meeting and then join. Maybe then it might work. Is that okay? Okay, okay. Please uh, switch on your microphone. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, good. So, so I just make it now full screen. It's, it's visible, right? The full screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, as a uh, um, as already mentioned uh, by some of you, that I am very much interested, you know, in understanding the inositol phosphate signaling in plant. So actually, I must say, you know, that how 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 did I come to know about this molecule? So when I was doing, you know, master degree at Vishwavarthi with uh, Sathi and Shumon, um, so basically uh, there is an opportunity to do a short short term research program, and that was uh, supported by Indian Academy of Science. So I went to CDFD Hyderabad, and there I you know, got to know about this molecule, inositol phosphate. And this is all what we know back then. This was all in about mammalian system. So my nothing was known about in plant. So this is the, the, the you know, the journey of the whole story begins. So anyways, so let me uh, start with short introduction, actually. So, you know, 
we all work, I mean, all are interested mostly in plant system, right? So why plant is so special actually? So, you know, being non-motile organism, higher plants face unique environmental challenges. For instance, they need to deal with the variety of public factors that include different quality of light, heat shock and cold stresses. Not only that, plants also need to worry about their neighbors, you know, with respect to nutrition, competence, and so on, so on. In order to survive, plants also need to, you know, respond accordingly against a library of biotic components that include different fungi, bacteria, and insects. Now, what is really important that perception of this environmental signal and the ability to respond accordingly are essential for plants to survive. So one of the ancient eukaryotic signaling pathways that evolved by land plant to cope with these environmental challenges is based on myelocytose derived signaling molecule. So myelocytose is just basically, it's, it's like a glucose-like molecule. It's not exactly glucose, so glucose is uh, linear. Here you see the cyclic form of the glucose. This is myelocytose. So this is a cyclic uh, polyalcohol and inositole derived signaling molecule mainly comes in two flavors, the soluble inositole phosphate the example shown here for inositol trees phosphate, where, where you know the mine, in the mine inositol ring, you have three phosphate group attached at portion one, four, and five. And you have also the membrane associated lipid molecules, which are normally or generally called phosphoinositate or phospholipid. So, one of the you know the classic inositol signaling pathway that you might have read in the textbook, I think we have uh, some of this context in plant physiology page in Jagger book. That you know, after activism, when phospholipid C cleaves the head group of phosphoinositol P2, it results in soluble inositol phosphate or IP3, which then diffuses through cytosol and binds to the receptor, which is a specific calcium channel localized in smooth endosplasmic reticulum. And the binding of IP3 to its receptor results in conformational change, which then results calcium influx into the cytosol, and which therefore control many different signaling pathways. I, I'm not going to go all of these details because of the, you know, the time uh, restriction. So what is important to know that such a signaling cascade that is only identified in mammalian system, not in plants. So this is very, very important. So the question what is really open, you know, so is this IP3, you know, is this, I mean, does this have any importance to the plant system or no? So basically this is something, you know, open question people try to address. Now, uh, besides this signaling cascade, what is also known that this IP3 molecule can be sequentially phosphorylated with help of different inositol phosphate kinases such as IPK2 and IPK1 that result, you know, IP4, IP5, and a fully phosphorylated inositol ring, which is known as inositol hexakis phosphate or IP6. This molecule was identified for the first time in plants almost 100 years ago. That's why this molecule also referred as phytic acid. Okay. Anyway, so this is this linear pathway that you see this mostly in yeast in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is like single cell organism. And you know, here the, the, the whole pathway, the cellular mechanism is rather simple. Let me say in this way, but when you look at the Dr. Lahab, please, uh, are you listening to me? Uh, your slide are, uh, is not moving. Uh, please uh, change your uh, slide. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So in which slide you are? Uh, it, it is the first slide. Oh, I went actually long, so maybe there is something wrong. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's moving. Laha, okay, me... can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I think uh, you are not in the presentation mode. It's it's like the... Uh... Yeah, no, 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 you're right. I, I was in presentation mode, but then it was not moving. So I just came back to the, to the original, you know. Okay. I think it's not a big problem. Can you see me? Uh, yeah, it's still it's still not in presentation mode. I understand this, but if I do this, okay, let me try one more time. Is this moving my slide? Yeah, yeah. Uh, please change one more time. It's no, moving? No. no. Okay, so let me present in this way. No, it's no, not a big no. deal. It, it happens. Uh, I, I Can I say something? Uh, if yeah. you present the whole window, rather than presenting a tab uh, and then go on to the uh, presentation mode because we use the Google platform for classes. So we know the bugs. That's why I'm giving okay, 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 okay. Okay, so great, if you share great. the whole window and then you go on to the presentation mode, then you cannot see us, but uh, we can see the whole thing. 
I feel sorry. I'm not so familiar with this platform. Let me try again. It's not a good platform to use, but no, this no, is I, what I we think it's a, it's, it's, it's a, So I have to share my entire screen, right? right? Your, That's you, what it is. Yeah, yeah, the entire screen, yeah. Okay, so I share my entire screen now. And then they say that window screen to share. So what shall I say? You, you share the whole thing. And then you go on to your uh, uh, presentation mode in your PowerPoint. You okay. share your entire screen first, and then you go on to the PowerPoint. And then probably we can see everything. Can you see my slide now? Yeah. We can, yeah, now you can go on to, yeah, now we can see, yes. Is it moving? Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. is. OK, good. OK, anyway, so maybe let me start again, actually. Uh, sorry about this. And if you do not you know, see it's moving again, so please let me know. Otherwise, I feel I'm, because in my case, it's changing. OK, so. Yeah, OK, so let me start now. OK, so as I said, you know, so why we are so interested? Why, why, what is so fascinating about plant, you know? You know, if you think about uh, a multicellular uh, uh, plant, I mean, plant can be also right? mostly mostly plant, animal. Oh, sorry? Oh, uh, yeah, the two mostly just are on, on India, we do that on India please all the participants switch off your microphone, please. Uh, please, please, Dr. Sir, please continue. Sorry okay. for the interruption. Okay, yeah. So basically, you know why? So the, the point I was telling to you that, you know, why the, the, the plant system is so fascinating because this is a non mutile organism. It can not, it can not, you know, move around, right? So basically, you know, being sessile organism, higher plants face unique environmental challenges. For instance, they need to deal with a different quality of light, heat shock and cold stresses. Not only that, plants also need to worry about their neighbors, you know, with respect to nutrition, competition and so on. In order to survive, plants also need to defend of our, you know, against a library of biotic components that include different fungi, bacteria, and insects. So what I try to say here, you know, the perception of all these environmental signals and the ability to respond accordingly are crucial for their survival. And it seems that one of the ancient ecotic signaling pathway that evolved by land plant to cope with these environmental challenges is based on inositol drive signaling molecule. So what you see here is a, you know, the inositol molecule, and uh, this is in chair conformation. So this is cyclic polyalkyl, and this inositol drive signaling molecule comes in two flavors: the soluble inositol phosphate. The example shown here for inositol disphosphate or IV3, where you have three phosphate attached at position one, four, and five, and the other one is the membrane bound. This is the phosphate inositol or lipid one. Okay. So one of the classic, you know, inositol drive signaling pathway that you might have studied in textbook is that upon activation when phospholipase C cleaves the head group of phosphoinositol P2, it will result in the soluble inositol T-phosphate IP3, which then diffuses through cytosol and binds to its receptor, which is a specific calcium channel localized in smooth endosplasmic reticulum. Now the binding of IP3 to its receptor leads to the conformation of change which then result calcium in plus to the cytosol, and therefore it control many different signaling processes. Now, what is important to know here that such a signaling pathway is only you know, identified in mammalian system, not in yeast, not in plant. So what does this IP3 molecule do in plants? So if you look at the, even in yeast system actually, so what happens, this IP3 molecule can be a precursor for high inositol polyphosphate such as IP6. So this molecule can be sequentially phosphorylated with help of, you know, IPK2 or IPK2, IP4, IP5, and a fully phosphorylated inositol ring, which is known as inositol hexakis phosphate or IP6. Because this molecule was first time identified more than 100 years ago in plants, this is also known as phytic acid, okay? Now this is for the, you know, the single cellular is system. Now if you look at the another complex system, multicellular required in higher organisms, such as you know the, the multicellular plant and uh, um, animals, what you see here that IP6, you know this fully phosphorylated inositolin can be produced either through lipid-dependent route or through lipid-independent route to a complex, you know, intermediate. So the pathway is not as linear as that is in yeast. So what the course of evolution, 
you know, the, the, the system also, the metabolite complexity has also increased. Now the question is, you know, what are these all? Are they just metabolic intermediate or do they have also signaling function? A question that has to be yet addressed. Anyway, I talked with you a lot about IV6. This is not the end of, end of the story. This molecule can even be further phosphorylated with help of yeast cases one and like enzyme that generate 5 IP7 having a diphosphate or pyrophosphate moiety at poison 5, which then becomes substitute for another class of enzyme in yeast, this is called beef one that generate 1 5 IP8 having an additional life respiratory group at poison 1. Now, this 5 IP7 and IP8 they are having one or more pyrophosphate moiety. Therefore, these molecules are referred as inositol pyrophosphate. So what is the difference between inositol phosphate and inositol pyrophosphate? That inositol pyrophosphate are also inositol phosphate molecule, but they have pyrophosphate moieties. Now, why talk about so much of this molecule? Just think about this, you know, if you need to prepare one molecule of IP7 or one molecule of IP8, you need to invest or a cell needs to invest seven or eight number of ATP. ATP is, you know, the energy, uh, our energy source, right? And just imagine, how or not a organism would invest so much energy to produce this molecule? That means they're good for something, right? What are they good for? Well, when you look at yeast and mammalian system, it seems like they're in, involved in almost all important physiological processes, such as immune responses, energy homeostasis, stress responses, insulin cycles, and DNA repair and apoptosis. I'm not going to go any of all of these details because in this way I'll kill all the time. What I want to say or what I want to present you, you know, what is about this molecule in plant? Why is this molecule or why are these molecules are important in plant? This is my interest and this is what you're going to talk. So if we want to address these two questions, so basically when I started my PhD, I thought maybe before I address, you know, this main big question, we have to focus on two fundamental questions. So what are these two fundamental questions? The first one, can we identify inositol pyrophosphate in plant or do they even exist in plant? Maybe in you know, Eastern uh, Maryland system, they have this. Maybe plant, even they don't have this thing actually. So you, know, you can forget about this. And then the second question is, if we identify inositol pyrophosphate in plant, then what are their physiological functions? Okay. And also the next question would be, how would you even study the physiological function? Okay. So let's come back to the first question. Can you identify inositol pyrophosphate in plant? So when I started my PhD, this was a HPLC profile that was available, you know, at the time. So what you see here is strong anion exchange chromatography. So basically high inositol polyphosphate, they elute later in the chromatogram. So basically that's why you see IP6 coming at the end, then IP5, you know, IP4, IP3, IP2, IP1. So basically, so this IP1, they elute at the column at the first place and then IP2, then IP3, 4, 5, 6. But if you look, so then where we should see the IP7 and IP8. IP7, IP7, 7, 8, they should come here, right? But we don't see them. So this was published from, uh, you know, John York, who is you know, Howard Hughes Medical Institute fellow uh, at, uh, at uh, Duke University back then. So I thought, okay, so then, you know, many people told that, that inositol pyrophosphate, they do not exist in plant. But I had a doubt, you know, I thought maybe, you know, they didn't perform well the experiment. So let's try again. So what I did actually, I established a protocol, you know, I am not going to go again all of these details. And then, so basically that allows the detection of this molecule. So this is a colonel, means a wild type plant, okay? So here you see again, like the previous profile, a huge amount of IP6, but some, some peak is coming up here, right? So if you just zoom in, this is what you see. So after IP6, you have a clear peak of IP7, as well as clear peak of IP8. That means inositol pyrophosphate, IP7 and IP8, they do exist in plant, right? So the take home message for the students here is, Never give up, give up on the fact that someone says this is true, this is not. You know, you try to always need to justify it is really true, at least in science, okay? So then, uh, since we can identify inositol biophosphate in plant, the next question is, what, I mean, what are their physiological functions? Why are they important in plants? And why plant would invest so much energy to produce this molecule, okay? So <clears throat> to address this question, so what do you need to do? We need to look for the you know, enzymes that are responsible for production of this uh, molecule that are present in Eastern mammalian system. We asked whether do they also exist in uh, plant. So what is very interesting that the case is one that makes IP6 to IP7 that is in yeast. So when you look at the plant genome, plant genome doesn't have this case is one. 
but they have still this IP7 molecule. So that means if you want to understand the function of this molecule, the first thing we need to do to identify the enzyme that is responsible for this production of this molecule, right? Okay. And then also we look for the VIP1 enzyme. Interestingly, we did find VIP1 holo that's present in all available plants, you know, from lower group of plants, you know, from the you know, algae, so then, then, you know, the bryophyte, tradophyte, and then angiosperm also, right? So in aridopsis, there are two homologs. We call them VIP1 homolog 1 or VH1 and VH2, okay? So then we looked at their expression pattern. So these are the two genes, how they're expressed in different plant, plant tissues, okay? So what we did actually, we take the root, you know, we take the leaf, seedling, different plant part, okay? And then we prepare, you know, the mRNA and then we synthesize cDNA and then we did a quantitative PCR. And with this, you know, we can tell that how much, you know, this gene they are expressed in this different tissue. So what it seems that VH1, the homolog one, that is mainly expressed in pollen. However, VH2, you see, this is expressed more or less all over the tissue. So basically, we first focused, you know, at the physiological function of this, uh, this, this VH2. So basically, the question we asked here, each VH2 responsible for IP8 production from IP7, okay? So how do you do this? So now I told you before that we have established protocol that allows successful detection of inositol pyrophosphate in plant. So what we did actually, we generate mutant of VIS2. So basically in plant, you know, uh, there is a library, it's called tDNA insertion library. So they, so this tDNA goes randomly, they goes ran, they integrated into the genome. And then by PCR, we can track where are they localized and we found that, you know, in a, in a VIS2 ORF, in a VIS2 gene, a huge junk of tDNA that, that got inserted. And we, you know, uh, isolated this line and then we analyzed the, the profile. So we basically, we have characterized VIS2 knockout line. So this is what you see. So if you just look at the left-hand side, it doesn't, it doesn't seem any difference, right? Compared to the wild type, which is called Loom, and the VIS2 mutant, which is VIS2-3, okay? Because we have independent mutant, we just show one of them. However, if you look at this zone, you see that the IP8 level in VH2 mutant is completely compromised. We do not see any IP8 that, okay? And also you see there is a little bit increase of uh, IP7. You know why? Because if you block the production of, you know, the substrate to be, you know, converted to be a product, then the substrate gets accumulated. So this is what is happening. So basically in this mutant, what we see that no IP8 and increased level of, or less a bit accumulated level of IP7. So basically with this experiment, we were able to conclude that VH2 is indeed IP8 synthetase in plants. Okay, so the next question is, so now we have identified uh, here, you know, a kinase that makes this molecule. So what happened to a plant that doesn't have this molecule? How this plant looks like, okay? So this is how the plant looks like. This is the, the left-hand side, the wild type plant, and the right-hand side, the VH2 mutant. And so this is the plant, they start flowering. You can see that there is no growth difference, you know? So I spent so much time, and then when I look at the, the, the phenotype, there's no phenotype, and I was very shocked. Oh my God, so this molecule is for nothing, okay? And this is like two different conditions. One is short day, it's long day con condition where plants start flowering, and, who, and the other one is short day, where you know the, the day period is, is, is shorter and the night period is larger. So there you also see no difference, okay? But I, I was not ready to give up. So I was looking at the plant all the time, you know, and then I was growing the plant and trying to see, you know, maybe they are different in, uh, they show different phenotype at different condition. So if you want to do experiment, you have to amplify this plant, right? You have to get enough seed. So when I was amplifying this plant, what I realized that in, a, in, a, in, in the greenhouse, you have a lot of insect. So some, the many insect, they, you know, came and they visit mostly the VH2 plant, not wild type plant. Or in other words, so what I, what I supposed to see in a re repeated manner, that VH2 plant get more infested or infected with different insect than wild type, okay? So this, you know, I saw this in a repeated manner and then this drug struck my mind Maybe, you know, this plant, VH2 mutant plant, that doesn't have any inositol pyrophosphate, somehow they are compromised in plant defense response, okay? 
So then, you know what? So basically for the plant defense response, if uh, you might know that, that you might have this hormone jasmine. So basically when a plant is attacked by, you know, pathogen like, you know, the, uh, the insect like pathogen, then there's immediate increase in plant defense hormone jasmine. Okay, so this we know by literature. That, that is not, not nothing new. So I was thinking, what happened if I take a wilder plant and then if I treat with the hormone, this uh, jasmine, the, the bio, bioactive form of jasmine in methyl jasmine. So if I treat this plant with the methyl jasmine, what happened? The inositol polyphosphate profile. Okay. So so basically this is what I did. I take the wilder plant and then I treat either with the control condition or with the hormone. And then look at the inositol polyphosphate profile. And this is what happened. This is what we see. So a specific increase of IPA level after the hormone treatment. And this is we see immediately after 15 minutes. So basically, in plant, when a pathogen attacks, it's not only the increase of jasmine, but there is also increase of inositol pyrophosphate IPA. That means, you know, that this molecule could be important for plant de defense. Not necessarily, because there will be hundreds of molecules that are going up and down, but you know this could be an important signaling molecule. Why, when do you call a molecule a signaling molecule? So basically, you know, if a molecule responds to the environment and then also this, you know, it transfers the signal by, you know, this if this molecule is being sensed by a receptor, right? And then transduce the signal, then this more or less we generally define as signaling molecule. Okay, so now these are all the scenarios. So what we have told you so far that you know um, uh, you know, so we have plant that do not have IP8, and this plant seems to be, you know, more susceptible to the pathogen. But this is just a, you know, observation. It, in, in, in science, you have to do more control experiment, more defined experiment, okay? So this is what we did. So basically, you know, so we take advantage of the caterpillar, in this case, you know, Mamastra brassicae. You see this little tiny caterpillar, they're just roaming around. So all what you need to do, you take a little brass, and place them, you know, in the wild type plant or in the mutant plant, and then you have to, you know, uh, enclose them in a, in a, in a within a, you know, the kind of mesh so they do not escape. So basically, all what you need to do is take the caterpillar and place either in wild type plant or in mutant plant, allow them to grow for some time, and then measure the larval growth, larval weight gain. It's a very simple experiment, right? So, and this is the result we got. So you see, so just look at the picture first. So compared to the wild type plant, the caterpillar that grown on the mutant plant, they gain more larval oil, right? They look much more healthier and fattier. So that means they like the VH2 plant very much, right? Yeah. And we can quantify the result and you can also see the result that the caterpillar, the larval oil, they gain more weight in the VH2 mutant plant uh, compared to the wild type. So what does it mean? So that means the VH2, the caterpillar, they like very much VH2 plant. Or in other words, BHS2 plants are susceptible to this pathogen, right? Okay, so this is like another level of confirmation. So it's not only the caterpillar experiment, there are many other, you know, with the uh, uh, fungal pathogen, also with bacterial pathogen, we did different kind of experiment. And we conclude that the BHS2 is important for plant defense response. So BHS2, what is BHS2? BHS2 that makes IP7 to IP8, okay? So then what do you know about the jasmine signaling pathway? So, you know, this experiment only tell you that VIS2 or VIS2 dependent inositol pyrophosphate is important for plant defense response. But this doesn't tell you the molecular mechanism and this is what we are interested in. So basically, you know, those who are not aware of the jasmine signaling pathway, I think this is in the textbook, but anyway, I can tell you again. So basically under normal condition, the jasmine receptor COI-1, they stay away from the jasmine re repressor, which is jazz repressor protein, okay? So jazz repressor, they constantly block the activation of the plant defense response. However, when there is, you know, the, the when the plant is attacked by insect or pathogen like, you know, the necrotal fungi, then there is immediate increase in jasmine as well as it bioactive form jasmine isolation, okay? And then this act as molecular glue, which bring this Y1 repressor protein the Koi1 protein in close contact with the jazz repressor. So this is what happened. And then this jazz repressor protein, they get ubiquitinated, get degraded, and that means now the transcription can start for the defense response gene and plant became defensive. 
So now knowing the signaling pathway, we wanted to know at which step BH2 mutant is compromised, okay? So I'm not going to go all of the data, but I just show you shortly. So what you see that compared to the wild type in BH2 mutant, there is no difference in jasmine to isolation, or if there's any difference, this is more. So one can, you can ask me, you know, maybe in the BH2 mutant, you have less jasmine to isolation, and that's why you see less response. That's explain everything, but it's not. We see the other way around, okay? This is most likely because of the feedback mechanism. However, when you look at the gene expression of the defense gene, as well as we look at the different defense response, we see indeed the BH2 mutant is compromised as expected. So this means what? This experiment tells us something. What is that? That BH2 mutant is compromised in the, you know, this pathway, this step, so which is like the perception of the just model. So this is like, you know, this feels like they, the BH2 mutant plant, somehow they might not able to form this complex properly, okay? So how do you prove that? How do you know that actually, okay? So this is a hypothesis. We have to testify the hypothesis. So basically, you know, uh, for this, I need to introduce you this crystal structure. You know, don't get scared. This is like, you know, what you see here that, you know, the koi one protein, the egg box protein that is co-crystallized with, you know, the the if the EB protein ligase adapter protein ox one, then uh, that was also co crystallized with the jazz repressor protein and the biotic form of jasmine adjustment isolation. You know, but you know this this doesn't tell anything. You no, know? what why why I'm telling this to you? Because when they look at the core of the crystal structure, they found high electron density. Okay, now by mapping the the the, the distribution of the base and the electron density. They, it later appeared that in the core, they have a inositol phosphate molecule, okay? So basically, so they crystallized this protein by accident, they found their inositol phosphate molecule, but they have no idea why, the, you know, how this inositol phosphate contribute to the plant defense response. So this is a jasmine receptor complex, right? So in the receptor complex, they found the inositol phosphate, okay? So now, my idea was that, you know, in the VI, so basically, when, when you treat the plant with the plant defense hormone adjustment, we see specific induction of IP8, number one. Number two is, we see the plant that doesn't make this IP8, which is VI to mutant, are compromised in plant defense response. So we think that in plant, IP8 is important for plant defense response, but how it could be important? So how could you show that, okay? So basically, we did some more experiments. We did so in I have so maybe I should point out in the crystal structure they found a IP5 molecule, not IP8. But you must know that you know this receptor was purified from insect cell, not from plant. Okay. So maybe so we have to show that which molecule is important is it IP5 or IP8. Okay. So in this induction we see clear level of IP8. Okay. And then we did another experiment and this. I think it will be more clarified. We performed a molecular docking you know, simulation experiment. So we fit the IP5 with the COI1 and IP8 with the COI1. And what you see is that compared to the IP5, IP8, they additionally interact with many amino acid residue of COI1, such as histidine, you know, arginine, and lysine. Now, okay, this is all the computational simulation. We have to show experimentally that the binding of IP8 is really important. How can you show you? How can you, what will be your experiment? So just, so what we did actually, we muted the amino acid that's supposed to coordinate with IP8 and then see, is this interaction is abolished? So we back from the is to have it assay, right? So this is what you see, this is a control experiment. And this is, so COI1 and JAS1, they're very nicely, the wild type COI1 and JAS1, the interaction happened very nicely, right? And then we part, we make a mutation on the COI1 that can, that's supposed to, you know, that cannot bind anymore with IP8. And you see, if you have a version of Y1 that cannot bind with IP8, it also cannot interact with JAS1. JAS is the repressor protein, right? So the interaction is completely compromised in all the mutant. So which means that binding of IP8 is very critical for Y1 function. And this is very direct experiment, okay? And then we did another kind of experiment, it's called uh, actually, so I didn't, I don't have this slide here, unfortunately. But anyway, so that's a, that is a more in to pull down assay, and there you could show that inositol pyrophosphate are beta ligand for the for the receptor complex. Okay, so what I have uh, described is so far actually, 
uh, no so so basically so all this study what brings new what brings new you know our study you know, to the whole concept so previously what i told you that when plant is attacked by insect or fungi there's immediate increase in jasmine and then it's at molecular load and then it you know bring this quite one and just put in together and then you know the protein get degraded and then transcription start however in this study what we have shown that is not only the jasmine it also has to depend on ip8 is important for the receptor complex formation okay and it has to come together at the same time same place so what i'm trying to tell you is that so you need to have both jasmine and ip8 at the same time same place then only the activation occurs now you can ask me why why on earth you have already one molecule and then why i you know the phosphate is coming into the play these are completely two structurally different molecule right so i tell you something you know so basically i grew up in kopai babuya so basically you know I, my father is a farmer so i used to go very often to the field and you also might have seen that the rice field or any plant you know those th that are infected with pathogen that dwarf you will clearly see the difference the healthy plant and the and the, you know the plant that are compromised in in in, in a pathogen difference they are very dwarf okay so why is that because when plant is attacked by pathogen they forget about all the process like growth and development they only focus on plant you know defense uh, the, the defense against pathogen because if they cannot win this you know the war then they would die so basically it's a very energy expensive process and this is the evolution of you know the plant or it's like the smart signaling pathway of plant therefore this is like double secure you know immune, immune, immunity so basically just imagine you know you have a like you know for instance uh, uh, how do i say so let's say you have a more important stuff in your house okay and there are thief outside they want to steal the important stuff in your house so what is good so if you have one guard it will be easy to you know fight against to, to win over the one guard but if you have two guard then it is more difficult right so this is this is what all happening inside the cell as also so this is like double secure immune uh, uh, response okay so this is the beauty of this story and this story was covered you know wild uh, worldwide and it also patented okay so now uh, i think i have few minutes left on this as i'll quickly tell one uh, short story not story even so so what in the study you know what i told you that vis2 is important for ip production and this ip is molecule for plant immune response okay so now what is important to know that what makes ip7 in plant i told you remember at the beginning that plant genome doesn't encode the canonical ip6 kinase that is present in eastern mammalian system so we want to know what makes you know uh, ip7 in plant the other thing is what are the isomeric nature of the uh, the denosetyl pyrophosphate is it like one which, at which position of this molecule is being phosphorylated how do i know okay so anyway you know uh, so one day you know while i was thinking you know how to identify ip6 kinase that makes ip6 to ip7 i came across through this paper you know when you want to do science what is really important that you read, read a lot of scientific literature doesn't matter which journal whatever you are interested you read a lot and this helps you know to get the idea very much so you see there is a, a report of inosul phosphate from entamoeba histolytica this is amoeba it's no plant but i'm still reading this paper right so in this story what they show actually that ip6 kinase of this organism that phosphorylate ip6 to ip7 in this study they show they can also phosphorylate ip3 to ip4 okay now so what strikes my mind actually so in plant you don't have ip6 to ip7 converting enzyme right so i was thinking but plant have the enzyme that make ip3 to ip4 ip4 to ip5 i thought can it be the other way around in plant so or if i if i you know the the, the reformulate my my statement the question i wanted to know or let's say the, the hypothesis i had can a nosotrol phosphate kinase that are responsible for ip3 to ip4 and ip4 to ip5 conversion can they you know be evolved to a ip6 kinase that should make ip6 to ip7 okay this was my hypothesis and how do you testify this hypothesis so this is i took advantage of a yeast system so this this is a triple mutant okay so this doesn't have inositol for any inositol pyrophosphate okay so you see that this triple mutant 
are very sensitive to high concentration of a certain metal in this concern in this case zinc now if you in this mutant background if you complement or if you heterologously express the east cases one which is east ip6 kinase you see very nicely this growth they you know they they can again survive in this harsh condition okay now what i did actually i clone all the inositol phosphate kinase they're supposed to phosphorylate lower inositol phosphate such as ip3 to ip4 or ip4 to ip5 and then you know i put them back and then see what happened and you can see that like the east ip6 kinase or east cases one two of the arabidopsis inositol phosphate kinase they can complement the growth phenotype right it's very nice and i was really astonished with the result and then but anyway this is a growth complementation you have to show directly by hplc profile right that is it that this contribute to the inositol phosphate profile so what i did so this is the hplc profile of the triple mutant i told you right so after ip6 you see there is no ip7 coming out but now if you heterologously express the for instance itp1 this is what you see like bingo like a huge level of ip7 right so that means this lower inositol phosphate kinase that that can make ip7 in plant and it's also true for you know the itpk2 so this experiment tell us clearly that itpk1 and 2 can catalyze the synthesis of you know social part of phosphate and ip7 anyway so we you know then actually this experiment doesn't tell us the isomeric nature the structure it might be complicated, but I did just tell you shortly. So then we perform the NMR actually. It's called two dimensional NMR. So we get a pattern of like this. So we got like, you know, the resonance of two is to one is to two, and then this two duplet. Okay, what does it mean? So basically one and three, four and six of inusual ring, they are enantiomer. Okay. So basically, the 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 NMR, the spectra, they cannot distinguish between between these two, two, two phosphate. So they see these two phosphate as a single phosphate. So this is two, okay? So that's why this is two, this is two, and this is a single phosphate. That's why this is the single one. And for the pyrophosphate, it's like you see a duplet. So this experiment can only tell us it could be either two IP7 or five IP7. But how do you know which IP7 is being made? So what we did, we did a spiking experiment. So we, what we did, we just take this, you know, uh, uh, ITPK product and then mixed with 5 IP7. As you can see, there's no difference in the spectra, right? So that means it's most likely is a 5 IP7. But now if you have 2 IP7, this is what you see. The additional peak is coming up, right? So that means clearly this is not 2 IP7. So this experiment confirms that ITPK is synthesized only 5 IP7. Okay. So with this experiment, now we can tell that in plant, ITPK 1 and 2 can make IP7 from IP6 and it phosphorylate at person 5. Okay, so now the last figure I want to show that you know, uh, so basically we then again do the gene expression pattern and we see you know this homolog they are expressed redundantly. So, how this plant look like? Okay, so what we see actually, so this plant looks like very dwarf, it's very sick computer. So, if you make mutation of the ITPK, that cannot make any more IP7. This plant is very dwarf. And actually, I'm not going to go all of this details. So we did a lot of experiment, and we can show, uh, we can prove that you know this mutant is compromised in auxin signaling pathway. So auxin is a plant growth hormone that comp uh, that that you know control various aspect of plant growth and development. Okay. So with all the experiment, what we have you know, uh, yeah. So what we have showed so far, actually, what I've mentioned to you, you that you know the inositol pyrophosphate IP7, they you know, the promote the, the oxygen receptor complex formation and the, you know, the, the control plant growth and development. On the other hand, inositol pyrophosphate IP, they take care, you know, the plant immune responses. So while, you know, the, the, the jasmonate and oxygen, the, the, the receptor, they're different, the common denominator of the signaling pathway are the inositol pyrophosphate, okay? So that means they are uh, the, the, the regulator for the, for the they, we can say that they are the molecular balance between the plant growth and development, okay, and immune nature. So with this, I want to end up my talk. Uh, so let me uh, acknowledge a couple of people actually. So Adolfo is my, my former PhD supervisor. He was a fantastic, you know, uh, boss and, uh, you know, he trained me a lot. And, uh, you know, I have like fantastic, you know, my, my uh, uh, 
colleague and i must thank the dad so that fellowship was very instrumental to you know to get the to start my to do my phd in germany and then i got a postdoc fellowship as you know satya uh, uh, sonakti mentioned so this is ghg fellowship this is again very competitive uh, fellowship so this is a grant i got and with this i came to you know the the, the uk and did my my postdoc so this is my phd laboratory this is gabriel shaf so he's again a, my great mentor and you know he was working with uh, with a complete different project and then i told him you know and gabriel you know i have an idea uh, you know uh, i want to execute in your lab and he said you know i don't have money so if you get a fellowship then you can come to my lab so then i applied this that fellowship i got this and this is the project we shoot today okay and of course so this is uh, uh, my current lab so you know uh, so i got have i have already now two phd student one project assistant one training and then more people will be also joining now this year and then i have all over the all over the world and now i'm very much thankful to you know the, the all the, the the funding from isc and uh, and dbt and other organization and of course thank you very much for your attention okay i just now stop sharing my slide i cannot hear you sir i cannot hear you you have to unmute uh thank you so much dr laha it's a, a very nice interesting topic and i think we all benefited from your speech uh now it's time to take uh, some questions uh, any questions maybe from the student ask me any question Uh, it looks like there is uh, no question. No worries. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. La, once again. Uh, now it's time to uh, for our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Momita Bandhavadhai. Uh, she is uh, assistant professor of Department of Botany, uh, University of Calcutta. Uh, she awarded her uh, bachelor degree from uh, Lady Brebong College. and master degree from balion science college uh, calcutta university and uh, she got her uh, phd degree from calcutta university on the topic uh, tissue culture and agrobacteria mediated transformation in uh, medicinal plant uh, her uh, research of interest area is uh, plant molecular uh, genetics uh, she visited saitama university uh, tokyo japan uh, as a part of indo japan cooperative uh, science program and uh, she is life member of many uh, scientific bodies uh, like uh, all india congress of psychology and genetics uh, botanical society of india east himalayan society of parmatophyte taxonomy and uh, ostrola sharma and ek sharma foundation of uh, kolkata etc uh, thank you so much ma'am uh, for accepting our invitation uh, now i think uh, up to you ma'am uh, please continue ma'am thank you shoikot for the uh, nice introduction and uh, i am very thankful to dr gautam chatterjee principal of krishna chandra college dr pallav jyoti pal iqsc coordinator dr shati shaha and shoikot shahu of the department of botany of the college for providing me this opportunity to interact with you all today and uh, i will uh, start my presentation and uh, uh, and i also want to mention that i really enjoyed uh, dr laha's talk i have a lot of questions but i didn't ask him just now uh, i'll ask him uh, later on uh, anyway so i'll start my presentation uh, first and uh, i hope uh, can you see my screen yes sir yes <clears throat> okay so the topic of my talk today will be when death means life uh, as uh, dr shati shah mentioned earlier i will be talking about autophagy uh, in plants uh, so dr shah had beautifully set the tone of today's uh, discourse uh, exploring the recent advances in plant science and incidentally uh, dr laha and my talk are more or less around the same uh, you know work overall topic of how plants adapt and adjust to stress so uh, 
plants actually live a stressed life. I know that we love to go uh, to green regions, beautiful places uh, where there is a lot of plants and that suits us, that de-stresses us. But if you look at the life of a plant, it is a particularly difficult one because it is exposed to a number of environmental stresses like heat, light, temperature, scarcity of water, uh, then again cooling, freezing, chilling, insects and herbivores, flooding, submergence and uh, excess or uh, deficiency yeah. of salts and heavy metals, a range of fungal and microbial pathogen as well as nutrient stress. And this is not you know, it, it's not necessary that all of these stresses come separately. They come together also. And uh, during a, uh, in a, in a span of very short time, a couple of days, a couple of, you know, weeks, months, year round and all of that. So plants actually have a very stressed life. Uh, so obviously when a plant gets stressed uh, or it uh, approaches senescence or it is wounded, uh, the plant cells die. Like, we know that plant cells come to life or new cells are brought about by mitosis and meiosis, but there are different pathways of plant cell death. And uh, with, as Dr. Laha pointed out that many of the fundamental researches initially were done on the animal systems. And later on, much later on, uh, people tried to compare what happens in the animal system with what happens, uh, whether that exactly is, is that what happens in plants. And as his work beautifully pointed out that plants have their own unique systems. Some of the systems are conserved from the very, uh, from the origin of the eukaryotic, uh, you know, phylogeny, but then there are modifications which are specific, very plant-like. So when we talk about the pathways of plant cell death, uh, this is a beautiful uh, uh, presentation of that. Uh, so this is a healthy cell and as a healthy cell, we know all of the uh, we are all plant scientists, so to say, and we, we know how a plant cell looks under the microscope, right? We have done that in our um, high school biology classes, in our undergraduate, postgraduate, and also people uh, who have been doing research, they know that a plant cell is a beautifully turgid structure with a huge uh, vacuole and nu nuclei, numerous chloroplasts, and also mitochondria, which we really can't see under a normal microscope. Anyways, when a plant plant cell is stressed uh, or a plant cell is undergoing death cascade, we find that uh, one of the instances is like this. It's called the apoptosis-like. So in why is it apoptosis-like? Because in animals, apoptosis is a very uh, conserved fundamental death process. And in plants, we see uh, similarities with the same kind of death pathway, but it is not exactly the same as we see in animals. So that's why it's called apoptosis-like. And we also see necrosis, which is a complete, you know, complete destruction, complete annihilation of the whole plant. The nuclear membrane gets broken, all the, uh, all the organelles get, get fragmented, and ultimately the cell completely dies. And Apart from these two, there is autophagy. Autophagy also takes place in animal systems, but in plant systems, uh, for a very long time, we really did not understand whether autophagy, how important autophagy was actually. So this is the topic of today's uh, discourse uh, that I'm presenting. So basically autophagy is when we see uh, there is a, uh, re, you know, recycling of the uh, cellular organelle. So I'll be coming to autophagy in a short time now. So when we we are stressed, uh, sorry. So when we are stressed, we animals are stressed. Uh, our response to stress is basically fight or flight. So we assess the amount of stress that we are facing, and depending on that, our reaction is perceived. So either we know that we can manage the stress, so we stand our ground and fight it or we understand that we cannot manage this, so let's run away. But if you look at plants, the plants don't have the option to run away, isn't it? They are rooted to the same spot all through their life cycle. But the plants are actually superheroes in that way because they stand at the same region and they stay put and they indeed fight and they fight it out really, really well. When the plants fight stress, the major, uh, you know, one of the major or the major uh, way in the, in the way that they fight stress is they compromise between growth and defense. So this is called the classical growth versus defense payoff. So 
typically what happens in a normal ambient condition when there is no stress there is abundant resources the plants grow very well right so all their energies are focused towards uh, cell division cell expansion the normal carriage of metabolic activities which we perceive as good health for the plant and this goes on till there is some kind of a stress and how does the plant know it is stressed because there should be some kind of a cellular damage there should be resource limitation and both of them then start to inhibit the growth of the plant so the growth control of the plant now gets disturbed and the growth diminishes and this diminished growth actually makes available uh, the energy and the resources for the plant to fight the stress so there is this aspect of stress defense as well as repair of the damages now you understand that uh, this stress defense and damage repair will ultimately determine whether the plant will survive the stress or it will not so there's another important consideration here that how much is this too much stress so how does a plant understand that this is the level of stress that i can manage and this is the amount of stress that is beyond my control and you know that it just gives up so uh, again uh, this determination or this decision comes from an interplay of two characteristics so there are two players here right one is the stress and one is the plant so this consideration whether the stress is too much or too little is actually an interplay of both of them so regarding stress the first thing that is important is the severity of the stress is it a minimum stress is it a moderate stress is it an excessive stress that is a very important consideration then the duration of the stress is it a transient stress or is it a prolonged continuous stress then the number of exposures is it a one time exposure or is it a persistent exposure for a long period of time and then uh, as i told you uh, just a bit earlier that whether it's a single stress which is never the case it's always a number of stresses which come uh, together influence or impact the plant and depending on the plant characteristics so i'm more interested in the plant than the stress because uh, that's what uh, we work on the plant so we uh, the organ or the tissue in question is very important uh, to me i think for me from my point of view i think that you know the roots and the photosynthetic leaves they are the most essential components of uh, uh, a plant you know basically the, because the roots will uh, do the plumbing thing take in uh, nutrients and also ions and all from and water from the soil pump it up and the leaves will photosynthesize and uh, this cross talk actually helps the plant survive so where is the stress focused on that's very important if the roots and the photosynthetic apparatus is not that much uh, affected then you know the plant will tide over manage the stress but if the roots are or the photosynthetic apparatus are most vulnerable then uh, there is there will be difficulty for the plant to survive then the stage of the development of the plant where it will be it it faces the stress uh, we all know that the seedlings are probably the most vulnerable when a plant stress uh, faces the stress adult plants are you know they more or less can cope up with uh, all kinds of stresses better than the seedlings can do then comes the genotype slowly we are understanding that uh, there are a lot of genetic components in a plant uh, that will help it adapt to different kinds of stresses and an interplay of both this the stress characteristic and the plant characteristics will ultimately determine whether the plant will resist the stress and lead a happy healthy life or it will be susceptible to stress and succumb to the stress or lead a very unhealthy life so uh, the beauty of uh, for me i mean i find it very fascinating that the plant has a very unique way of responding to stress you know stress can be as you know we love categorizing things the plant does not know whether it is an abiotic stress or a biotic stress what the plant has actually uh, you know the plant don't have uh, the plants do not have a very organized immune system or a very sophisticated uh, signal perception perception system like the ones that we have and 
sorry, we animals have. But what the plants have is a very simplified yet very effective response cascade to any and all kinds of stress. So this stress response cascade in plants is basically universal you know it happens for all kinds of stresses and it's the simplicity of this stress response cascade that probably makes the study of this uh, aspect so very intriguing so the stress can be of any type it can be abiotic or biotic stresses but you know the see the plant response cascade is more or less the same so initially the plants will perceive the signal that it is stressed then that will start a signal cascade right and that signal cascade is typically mediated through calcium ions and also reactive oxygen species as well as the phytohormones mm -hmm. then this signal transduction will ultimately go into the nucleus and it will target the transcriptional activation of a number of stress responsive genes as well as those genes which are involved in controlling the redox homeostasis of the plant cell because maintenance of the radio redox homeostasis is the most important aspect of maintenance of a normal and healthy plant cell life and th if that is upset then the plant cell immediately goes into stress so on one hand the plant cell will try to maintain the redox uh, control and control the redox or maintain the homeostasis and on the other hand it will uh, you know, start, kickstart certain stress responsive genes. And these stress responsive genes will then, uh, are, actually, they do code for what we call the direct action protein. So these are targeted exactly against, you know, the specific stress that, it, that there is, like the heat shock proteins or the antioxidant enzymes, which again go to maintain the ROS, um, manage the ROS and the osmoprotectants and the chaperones and stuff like that. So all of that will eventually lead to plant st stress tolerance and resistance. Another interesting, so that's that's what I said. So it's a universal or generic pathway. Another interesting thing regarding plant stresses, typically we think that the plants do not have a very good signaling system, like, like a huge pine tree, you know, which grows several feet, several meters actually. So what if there is a stress at the very top? Will the bottom part ever perceive that the stress was there? But it does perceive and it perceives beautifully. And we know now that the stress response cascade of the plant has certain local responses where at the point of, or the site of the impact of stress, there is a localized response. And then there are the systematic responses. So what happens if I take this particular example, then you can see that uh, this is an Arabidopsis plant. So they have a rosette of leaves at the very bottom. And uh, if you expose a few leaves here to very high intensity light, then it is perceived as stress by these leaves and uh, these leaves will then uh, you know upregulate aba biosynthesis and through ros and calcium ion mediated signal transduction cascade ultimately they will lead to the closure of the stomata to prevent uh, transpirational water loss and uh, maintain the turgidity of the leaves but that is not just what happens what you know the other leaves which are not exposed to this light and are normally growing under uh, ambient conditions they also perceive uh, that the other part of the plant is under stress and this is typically through the ROS and calcium ions which are produced by the stressed cells and they are let go into the intercellular spaces and they pass on to the unexposed part of the plant and there they induce what we call the systemic responses so there again a same kind of response cascade starts and we uh, find stomatal closure in the complete plant even though only a small part of the plant is exposed to this particular stressor and now uh, very recently we are also understanding that this is not just contained within one plant this kind of a perception of stress can probably move from one plant to the other so in a huge field imagine one uh, part of uh, uh, if a stress starts 
perpetrating from one corner by the time it reaches to the farthest corner of the field we find that many of the plants at the furthest corner are already ready primed to face this stress so that cannot happen if there is no uh, you know cross talk between the plants which are in the field so the plants talk and amra bangali ta khub bhalo kore jani gachera kotha bole because jagadish chandra bose amader onek din age bole gechilen kintu jani na the world is now just waking up to the fact so this is i just told you about that stress perception is uh, stress uh, management is all about perception of the stress and the initial responses then combating the stress and finally overcoming the stress or succumbing to it now our experience uh, or our focus uh, when we work in our lab has been uh, regarding this uh, group of molecules the reactive oxygen species so this is another what we call necessary evil so reactive oxygen species are very important for normal growth of the plant because these are primary as well as secondary signal transducers in a number of very crucial essential uh, plant uh, cascades but even a very small amount of perturbation or increase in the ros uh, amount inside the cell can trigger a uh, 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 generalized stress response in the plant cells so i, I i'll just point out that uh, any uh, there are lots of ros generation sites so chloroplast mitochondria peroxisomes cytosol apoplast cell walls membranes all of them are capable of producing loss ros so imagine when a plant is stressed or a plant is facing some uh, you know external uh, stress which is uh, pro probably damaging the structural integrity of the plant so the cell walls get damaged ros is produced uh, the uh, the the stressor enters the cytoplasm uh, ros is produced they damage the chloroplast mitochondria ros is produced and that sort of builds up you know uh, a very high amount of uh, ros in the inside the cell so once that amount builds up there are lots of ros processing pathways as well lot of ros sinks as we call them but uh, you know what happens that their uh, their ability to manage ros is uh, up to a particular threshold beyond that uh, they cannot manage that much of a ros accumulation and that creates the uh, ros uh, the, the ros mediated stress response cascade so now i come to my uh, topic of interest which is uh, autophagy as i just said so the term autophagy is kind of self explanatory auto means self and phagos means to eat so basically the very simplest definition of autophagy happens to be self eating so a cell eating itself is autophagy right so it seems to be very weird that how can a cell eat itself but actually the scientific explanation is that uh, this is a very beautiful method by which a cell tries to manage uh, the recycling of its uh, broken down or damaged cell organelles right and uh, people got i mean the or work on autophagy was going on for a long long time because uh, east was a very good system in which people were working on looking at uh, at on autophagy uh, then people were was looking at animal autophagy also uh, people especially who work on metabolic disorders they were finding that autophagy was very important and in 2016 uh, professor yoshinori um, Osumi won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, and his work was for the discovery of mechanisms of autophagy. And we became very excited with that because our collaborator uh, in Saitama University, uh, Professor Moriyasu, is actually a collaborator, or uh, he actually worked with Professor Osumi and uh, on plant autophagy. So we were work. We are. we who are working in plant autophagy uh, we got a boost that yes this is very important uh, for management of uh, life as it is so let me uh, use a cartoon uh, to um, to explain what uh, autophagy is all about so this is all about self eating but this is not self eating to destroy yourself this is self eating to survive because uh, basically what happens that when a cell is in metabolic stress right so inside the cell the signal cascade starts which gives out the, uh, the gives out the message that the cell is getting 
the cell organelles are getting damaged. So that turns on the autophagy cascade. So when the autophagy cascade is turned on, there is a formation of the phagophore. So phagophore is derived from the endoplasmic reticulum and all the vesicles that there are inside the cell. And uh, the phagophore tries to envelop all the broken down organelles, which are you know producing ROS, more and more ROS. So in uh, then what happens is slowly the phagophore engulfs the whole or more most of the broken down organelles and that is called the autophagosome production and inside the then they go and merge with either the lysosomes or in case of plants they go and merge with the vacuoles and the lysosomes and the vacuoles are repositories of huge amount of enzymes which are capable of breaking down all these damaged organelles into the very basic molecules, the biomolecules, which they return to the cell for remaking the same um, uh, organelles that are digested in this way. So this uh, is a very, very uh, essential component of the plant cell to manage stress. So when a plant cell faces stress, it doesn't immediately die it starts the uh, response cascade, it tries to manage the stress, but again, beyond a threshold, this is not possible. So, but what we believe is autophagy, the switching on of the autophagy cascade gives the plant time to, you know, ensure that it survives the stress. Then the next question was for us to understand that is autophagy normal? I mean, is it something weird that happens only when the plant is facing stress or is it a part of the normal developmental program of the plant cell? So it is very interesting that autophagy is used by the plant system. It's switched on and switched off regulated by the developmental cascade of the plant. So autophagy induction happens during particular developmental stages. It happens during nutrition starvation. It happens during senescence. It happens during the response of the plants to pathogen. For example, you must be knowing about the hypersensitive response. So hypersensitive response is when a a pathogen attacks a plant it affects a particular leaf and what we find is that the whole region around the leaf it is completely degraded right and uh, uh, around the point of infection i'm sorry is completely degraded so, the, so these cells die in an effort to save the cells around it and a critical component of the hypersensitive response is autophagy and the rest of it uh, raw straw salinity heat stress hypoxia this is the ones that we are interested in so we find find that the autophagy has very crucial functions in tissue development i've taken just one example a very common example we all know about air and chyma right so these are the huge air gaps that open up uh, in uh, the stem or uh, any other compact organ uh, for the plants which have a free floating or a floating uh, kind of um, habitat. So we, what we find is that autophagy, controlled autophagy has a very big role. Suppose this is the normal early in the developmental stages, the gaps don't happen just like that, right? So early in the developmental stages, we find that one cell uh, probably, you know, self digests itself and it, uh, it, it creates the, the gap and slowly cells around it start to digest and that creates the uh, big uh, air gaps that help in the plant to float in water. So this is one example. There are lots of other examples as well. So tissue development uh, borrows autophagy time and again to give the tissues their particular conformation. They are involved in uh, nutrition remobilization, especially sugar remobilization in immunity, as I said, in HR response and uh, in cell death as well. This is controlled cell death, as well as in maintenance of cellular homeostasis stress response and quality control of the proteins and organelles that it degrades and replenishes. So we are interested in these two aspects, how autophagy can help in maintain cellular homeostasis and also in stress response. And another thing that interests us is what is the role of ROS in this whole story? So just showing you the picture of a plant cell, I am always very intrigued by the structure of the plant cell because I still believe we don't know much about the plant cell uh, and how it looks. Because when we were studying, we were only interested in studying about the nucleus and the chloroplast, which is very unique to the plant system and the mitochondria as well, because that's where the 
respiration takes place, the energy hub of the plant cell, so to say, we never talked a lot about the vacuole or the endoplasmic reticulum. And you know, now only now we are realizing how important the vacuole and the endoplasmic reticulum are in a uh, context of plants managing to survive stress or plants managing to change their plant cells, managing to change their structure, alter their structure, alter their phenotype to combat a particular amount of stress. The vacuole is particularly important because uh, when a plant cell divides and then it elongates, you know, growth has two major aspects in case of plant. One is division and one is differentiation through elongation. So this plant cell elongation, the the plane in which the plant cell will elongate is actually determined by the vacuole because that's where that that in that plane the vacuole you know expands and that creates the plant that makes the plant cell stretch so uh, and an adult plant cell uh, in an adult plant cell the vacuole is the largest organelle that there is and now we know when we study autophagy we also know how important it is in recycling of the plant and ensuring that the plant cell survives properly so uh, as I told you, slowly we are now concentrating our attention on the vacuole and the endoplasmic reticulum as well. So in the last few years, you know, in the last uh, around uh, 10 years and so, uh, people have got the idea of how autophagy and plant stress response are related. So this uh, graphic shows you the very same and this is what we try to work on so basically the, the plant cell is stressed by biotic or abiotic stresses so at the plant level we find that the stress plant tries to survive but if it cannot it leads to early senescence or death and during the process of the plant trying to manage stress autophagy comes into play so what autophagy basically does is it works at the cellular level. So at the cellular level, it, what it does is it takes on the damaged organelles and proteins, which are persistent sources of overproduction of ROS, and then uh, it recycles it. And uh, inside the vacuoles, it completely breaks down into the bio biomolecules of interest, like the monomers, amino acids, exoses, etc., which are then utilized by the plant to recreate or for the biogenesis of the very organelles that it had recycled. So like chloroplast, mitochondria, all of them are uh, produced or uh, in the uh, by the broken down uh, raw materials that the vacuole provides the cells. So this creates a pool of healthy organelles and important proteins and that enhances the stress tolerance of the plant and that allows the plant to survive. So how well, how, how well the autophagy cascade works, how fast the autophagy cascade is switched on probably determines the capacity of the plant or augments or enhances the capacity of the plants to survive. So though we see autophagy or though classically autophagy was seen as a cell death cascade, we are more interested in finding out how autophagy can enhance the survival of the plant under stressed condition. So if we talk about the pathway of autophagy, there are two parallel pathways which are going on. Initially, since autophagy was related to nutrition, uh, there, there was the tor dependent pathway. So don't be very worried about this whole picture. I will not be explaining the exact cascade, uh, but I'm just showing you to showing you this to uh, emphasize the point that there are lots and lots of molecules which participate in this process. And one of the major group of or classes of molecules is called the ATG class or the autophagy related proteins. And there are lots of them and they form different kinds of heteromers and that uh, the different kinds of heteromers lead to the progression of different stages of autophagy. Are uh, this uh, TOR dependent, obviously if the name is TOR dependent pathway, so you understand one of the major uh, switch ons of this happens to be the TOR kinase. So this cascade is uh, channelized through the TOR kinase, which is the first switch on for the process and then uh, it goes on by induction, then membrane delivery, then formation of the vesicle, then closure of the vesicle, then taking it to the new uh, vacuole, docking it to the chloro, uh, to, to the tonoplast and finally incorporation into the vacuole and its digestion. So when this pa only this pathway was known, people were not very sure how this could be related 
to the uh, stress response cascade because uh, there was a the, 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 everything got stalled at the first uh, even before the induction stage so there was no connection there but over time slowly research showed us that there is another independent pathway so this is the beauty of plants you know that there are always parallel pathways which the plant can fall back on the, the what we call the plasticity of the plants so the plants actually have a inordinately huge genome if you compare it to the animals the plants always have a huge genome and we really don't know exactly why it needs so much of the genomic complement but probably it is necessary for the plants because they are always combating stress and they need to switch on and off different cascades so need, they need the pool of all the genes that there can be to enhance their survival so what we know now is that there is a pathway which is uh, the uh, this is channelized through this uh, molecule the snf or the sucrose non oh, okay so just let me tell you first that this whole cascade was initially worked out in east so the names all come from the east mutants that they were worked out from so the snf basically means the sucrose non fermenter so this is the snrk1 so this is another kinase the tor kinase was one kinase so this is another kinase so this is the snf1 related protein kinase and it can bypass the tor mediated signaling and come first uh, if you see here the tor cascade also uh, leads to the form i mean when the induction needs atg1 so it's very crucial molecule and uh, so snrk1 can completely bypass the tor pathway and induce the atg1 and the atg1 can then take over the form the the whole uh, autophagy cascade so recently we have been able to uh, correlate uh, different types of biotic and abiotic stresses especially abiotic stresses with the induction of snrk1 so let's see what happens inside the plant cell during stress so as i told you the story is huge you know uh, as dr laha pointed out one part of the story uh, it's like a jigsaw puzzle so all of us work in very small parts of the jigsaw try and understand exactly what is happening and then probably one day we'll be able to put together the whole story so in our uh, lab we are in our group we focus on how the ross works and we also see that how uh, stress induced from all the cellular components are integrated and they go on to induce the stress response genes and that leads to what we call the local and the systemic signaling so this is uh, our hypothesis that we want to link autophagy with plant stress through the production of ross so when you have to do experiments like that you need to have uh, you need to design experiments to see uh, so i'll just tell you very simply how we do the experiments we stress the plant cells using different kinds of stressors we uh, since ross is our primary uh, concern we see how ross is over accumulated then we see whether autophagy is induced or not and then we try and find out the correlation between the two we enhance ross and see whether autophagy is enhanced we switch off ross and see whether it has any impact on autophagy we switch off autophagy and see what happens to ross now so we try and make experiments with different kinds of controls to kind and of, kind of find out the interrelation between the two so uh, i will today i will be focusing on most of the experiments by in which we use the fluorescent markers and fluorescent microscopes because they give us very beautiful pictures that we can show the students and uh make them intrigued probably so uh, one of the major uh, molecules that uh, or one of the major markers that people have been using recently in case of uh, for detecting autophagy happens to be the atg8 protein why the atp8 8 protein because it's it's a it's a protein that uh, initially remains in the cytoplasm then during phagophore formation it coats the phagophore you know the for the, the initial phagophore uh, formation it is there then it is also in involved in the elongation and sealing of the autophagosome and it is uh, it can be visualized till the cargo is delivered into the vacuole and uh, inside the vacuole also so atg8 was picked up as a target protein and then how do we see atg8 protein we cannot see look at a protein um, uh, under the microscope and say that yeah yeah that is the protein so what is done is uh, the gfp the gene fluorescence protein is used here and uh, in this case a fusion protein was made where the gfp was fused to the n terminal end of the atg 
uh, eight. So what happens is now uh, you can see I have put in two pictures here. So initially, uh, for the first uh, stages, you know, first two stages, uh, you can see diffused uh, GFP fluorescence all across the cell. So here. Uh, we take it as uh, early autophagy or no autophagy for that matter. But once the autophagosomes are formed, we see these dots. You know, these dots mean that circular structures bearing the GFP, ATG8, fusion proteins have formed and they are nothing but the autophagosomes. So production of the autophagosome is very beautifully uh, you know uh, uh, shown by the formation of these green dots of gfp uh, atg8 fluorescence and uh, you can also see that they are going and uh, st st sticking on to the vacuole here so this is one of the methods how we actually investigate uh, whether autophagy is taking place or not so till now, what I said was that the plants do face a lot of stress, which they fight using a generic pathway. And we believe that ROS is a key molecule that controls this plant stress response. And uh, autophagy has been identified as an important component of plant stress response. And ROS can induce autophagy via a TOR independent pathway also. And the process of autophagy can be visualized using the ATP, GFP, ATG8 fusion proteins. So now I will just uh, take you briefly through what we do in my, what we try to do in my laboratory. The first thing is that uh, our hypothesis is that ROS signaling can induce autophagy and autophagy is then, can be used rather to increase the stress endurance of plants. Uh, obviously, we have to use model plants to elucidate our point. So in that case, we use Allium sepa, which is a very standard toxicological model plant. And uh, to look at what happens inside a cell, because uh, the stress response is actually generated from single cells, but from individual cells. So to look inside what happens inside a cell, we use the BY2 uh, cell lines, the bright yellow 2 cell lines that are derived from Nicotiana tobacco. And the stress that we use, uh, we, we use a stress that we can control in intensity. So we use uh, generally environmental nanopollutants like engineered cerium oxide or nickel oxide nanoparticles. Uh, we, we also we have also done some work with uh, fungal toxins as well. But you know, for us, the stressor is not that important. The stress response is our key concern. And uh, what we kind of look into is how does ROS how is ROS signaling induced upon st stress risk exposure? Uh, does does ROS actually induce autophagy in the stress plants that we are working on? And does switching on of the autophagy cascade help the plant in any way in surviving the particular stress that we are talking about? Uh, so I have taken this from uh, the pre presentation of one of my students. So uh, it's a bit explicit, but I thought since I'm talking to students, I will like rather tell the whole story. So the story starts from the fact that, yeah, there are lots of, uh, are, 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 along with the stresses that we talked about, now there are pollutants, a number of pollutants, which also threaten uh, the plants. And among them are the metal oxide nanoparticles. And we are not even aware of the amount of metal oxide nanoparticles that are there around us and that we are continuously dumping into the environment. So this is an example of cerium oxide nanoparticle. And one of the most common uses of cerium oxide nanoparticle happens to be the shiny surfaces of the compact disks, you know any UV protection, uh, whatever is glistening, uh, definitely has cerium oxide nanoparticle. And uh, now the nanotechnology has become so big that, uh, and it has it is so convenient. I'm not trashing nanotechnology, but it is so convenient that people have been using nanomaterials in every aspect of uh, human uh, consumption. But the fact remains that these are dumped into the nature and this is actually affecting the productivity and survival of a lot of plants and we are not even very aware of it so our experimental design is not very complicated what this is one of the basic experiments that we do so basically we as i told you we take two systems alium sepa and the in vitro 
cell cultures of Nicotia nutabecum, and we hydroponically expose the, uh, the the plant systems to different concentrations of the nanoparticles. So that's also a test that you have to do when you start an experiment that you use a lot of concentrations to see exactly the concentration which will be uh, the which which will give you the lit most lethality or or the 50% lethality, and then you work on with the concentrations as well as the time of exposure, and then slowly you look at uh, how much cells survive. Uh, first, you look at whether the nanoparticles have entered the plant cell or not, because if they have not entered, you cannot say that this is the cause of the stress. So you have to show that the nanoparticles have entered the plant system. You have, uh, you also have to show that whether they are transmitted inside the cell. You also have to show whether they are transmitted across the tissues that you're talking about. Uh, then you see how much cells have survived exposure to these nanoparticles. Then you look at the uh, primary messengers, the calcium concentration, uh, ROS, uh, calcium, calcium ion concentration. Then you look at whether ROS is getting produced. You look at the antioxidant machinery. You look at whether autophagy, we look at whether autophagy is uh, starting or not. And then we see whether DNA damage is happening or not. Because if there is lots of DNA damage, that means the plant cell has already gone into necrosis and it cannot be saved. So we have to look at the entire range of interaction of the nanoparticles with the plant cells. So when we look at cytotoxicity, uh, we do a number of assays. So I'm just representing two assays here. One is the TTC assay, which is a very classical assay. And uh, from a colorless compound, uh, the, the, the thing gives uh, the view a form as a colored compound is formed. And spectrophotometrically, the survival percentage of the cells can be assayed. And the second experiment, the second uh, 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 experiment that was done was using resazurin and uh, that also uh, from a blue uh, compound of low fluorescence we get a, a pink and high fluorescent compound and only the viable cells can do this now uh, so metabolic state of the cell is uh, uh, am given by the resazurin assay whereas the cell survival or viability is given by the ttc assay so uh, here, uh, I, I'm representing the results from the cerium oxide uh, uh, experiment. So you can see that this was the control. So cerium oxide was not there. Uh, this was uh, the, the lowest amount. This was uh, 50. This was 250. And along with it, uh, as I told you earlier, that we try and put in uh, negative regulators or inhibitors of different cascades and then show whether they interact or not. So NAC, N-acetylcysteine, happens to be a ROS inhibitor. So we put in that to just show whether uh, you know ROS is the one that is killing this or ROS generation is happening in the cells that have died. And then we have used one millimolar H2O2, which is a reactive oxygen species. So that's our positive control. And then we have used all the concentrations that we use uh, that uh, of uh, cerium oxide uh, with uh, one millimolar H2O2. And basically, what we find is that. The, uh, normally, uh, the cells, the positive controls show the least amount of uh, cell survival and metabolic activity. So that's uh, obvious that it's very harmful for the cell survival. And we find that the metabolic activity of the cells uh, growing in cerium 10 uh, and the survival, both of them, are quite comparable. To the uh, uh, to the control cells, so cerium oxide, cerium ten is not that much of a stress probably. And another interesting thing is that if you knock out ROS, so uh, this bar also shows that cell survival is almost like the control. So that means that ROS is probably one of the major triggers which is causing a dip in the metabolic activity as well as cell survival in this experiment. So this is a preliminary observation. So we determine which is the uh, concentrations that we need to look look into what is the cell survival rate whether the cells are metabolically active active or not and then we move on so the second experiment that we do is to characterize the ROS I mean how much ROS is produced which type of ROS is produced and all so here we have I am showing you the results of two experiments uh, in the first experiment we are using a blue fluorescent uh, dye or an indicator as we call it which is the uh, dihydroethidium DHE it's also called the hydroethidium and it normally has a blue fluorescence uh, until it gets oxidized and it obviously gets oxidized if there is a surplus of ROS and then 
uh, it gets a bright red fluorescent color. So the transition from blue to red color is the one that we are looking for. And in the other experiment, we are using the uh, dichlorodihydrofluorescein diacetate or DCFDA, which diffuses inside the plant cells. And it is deacetylated initially to form a non-fluorescent uh, non fluorescent compound. And then in, if there is a if there is ROS inside the cell, then that uh, you know rapidly converts it into a highly fluorescent uh, dye. So we are looking for both of them, the change of blue to red fluorescent here, and also to the formation of the DCF to tell us whether the cells that have been exposed have ROS or not. So this is how we saw, this is what we saw rather, I'm sorry. So the first panel, the A panel is about the DHE staining as is, and as you can see, that uh, this these are just the nanomaterial this is the control and these are the nanomaterials so as the nanomaterial concentrations increase we can see an increase in the red fluorescence so that is telling us that slowly the ROS is building up here and now this is when uh, the ROS is completely inhibited so this looks like control and here we have put in the one millimolar H2O2 along with the uh, minimum amount of um, nanomaterial that we have given so we have we have seen we are seeing that uh, since this has negligible ROS production effect whatever is happening here due, is due to H2O2 we understand that and this is the positive control obviously and if you look at the next panel the B panel here also you can see that the formation of the fluorescent green compound that slowly increases with the increase in concentration of uh, ROS and uh, well, sorry concentration of nanomaterial use which in, which which tells us that increasing nanomaterial con con uh, concentration uh, causes more ROS to accumulate inside the cell. And here also we are seeing the same thing that the positive control is showing uh, quite a lot of uh, in, uh, intercellular ROS production. Uh, while here uh, we are seeing that uh, uh, at completely ROS inhibition, we hardly see any green fluorescence. And uh, another parameter for uh, uh, perception of stress happens to be calcium ion signaling. So here also we see that initially control has quite an amount of uh, calcium ion. Obviously it is necessary for normal uh, survival of the plants as well. But here what we can also see is that at uh, 250 there is a huge amount of uh, calcium ion accumulation here and uh, that is also uh, shown uh, uh, around this. Uh, and here you can see that uh, at uh, the exogenous NAC with exogenous H2O2, here also we can see a lot of uh, calcium ion uh, influx uh, or a calcium ion uh, presence. Then we are convinced that yes, ROS is increasing, calcium ion is also increasing. So what is happening to the antioxidant enzymes? So you can see I'm not going into details, but we did a lot of antioxidant enzyme assays and all of them increased with the increase in ROS. So, and at the positive controls, all of them dipped. So what it means is that beyond the thre threshold, this also the antioxidant defense responses also go down. But initially, uh, with increase in ROS, they do go on increasing. Then I told you about the growth and defense payoff. So we looked at whether the cell division was taking place uh, or the cell division was also affected. So we uh, do, did some flow cytometric estimations. And what we found is that, yes, cell division was completely affected. And most of the cells got frozen at the G0, G1 transition. And they did not go into the S or the G2M phase, rarely went into the S or the G2S phase. So that was. Uh, uh, an indication that the plant is now in stress response mode and it is not willing to go into division. So now was the time to see whether autophagy is actually a player in this process. So what we did was we used uh, the uh, an autophagy inhibitor, the E64C. So it's a general protease inhibitor, and what it does is it does not allow the ultimate, uh, you know, docking of the cargo of uh, into the vacuole. So whatever you see, you see in uh, lots of inclusions in the cytoplasm, but they do not, they are not uh, transmitted into the uh, vacuole. So this is the control cell. As you can see, this is the control cell. So it's a beautiful cell, lots of big, big vacuoles, you can see. Uh, but if you look at the for this cell, you can see that uh, there are lots of dotted inclusions. There are lots of, you know, uh, humps and lumps here. Um, 
so that was an indicator that probably uh, uh, the initial stages of autophagy are on uh, uh, anyways and then uh, you look at the higher concentrations where uh, this actually uh, goes down this accumulation actually goes down so, and but and you can see the cell morphologies are also looking very weird this is a normal cell morphology so this is the nucleus these are the vacuoles if you compare this to this cell you can hardly find any proper uh, you know organellar uh, 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 arrangement here which means that these cells are far beyond uh, you know in probably going into necrosis or probably going into some kind of uh, um, uh, or uh, uh, they are beyond repair probably and then we looked at the uh, our transgenic cell lines which are expressing the gfp 80 g8 so these are the control cells and we can see diffused uh, uh, presence of the diffused uh, gfp 80 g8 protein in the cytosol and around uh, different organelles and at 10 uh, microgram per ml of cerium oxide nanoparticle we can see the formation of the autophagy dots and some dots are also visible in 50 microgram per liter but at 250 there is nothing there right and then we also counter confirmed our observations using acridin orange so you know acridin orange basically marks the acidic vacuoles and acidic vacuoles are formed uh, the uh, by uh, when uh, the autolysosomes are there so here as you can see that uh, the red dots are all the those formation of the autolysosomes uh, so this is a part of the autophagy cascade so we are doubly confirmed that yes autophagy is taking place here even at 50 microgram we find the presence of some uh, autolysosomes definitely here and uh, but beyond that we don't find it so we can now argue in favor of autophagy being induced by the uh, nanoparticles that we had exposed our plants to so this is not only for a single uh, for a single uh, in, uh, engineered nanoparticle this happened uh, when we used other nanoparticles also so you can see formation of the gfp uh, atg8 uh, marked uh, autophagosomes the dotted alls there they, they all tell us that yes autophagy is taking place so this this is for another nanoparticle and we also tried and replicate that in alium sepa so remember we don't have an atg uh, gfp atg8 express expressing alium sepa transgenic line so here what we did was we used a fluorescent stain it's an auto fluorescent compound uh, monodensyl gadaverine and uh, there these actually uh, accumulate in the acidic autophagic vacuoles so uh, here these are the root tip cells of uh, alium sepa and here you can see the formation of the autophagosomes beautifully exemplified uh, after an uh, nano an nickel oxide nanoparticle exposure so we were sure that yes and uh, the nanoparticles that we were exposing the plants to both the plant systems switch on autophagy uh, first they in how the cell survival is affected uh, we also saw that there are lots of uh, damage from the um, to the organelles, uh, calcium uh, ion uh, cascade is uh, disturbed, uh, ROS is overproduced, uh, antioxidants uh, are initially overproduced but then they go down and uh, we also see autophagy being induced. Then we looked at whether the DNA was affected or not. So whether there was any genotoxicity also uh, by the exposure of the plants uh, to the uh, uh, to the in engineered nanoparticles. And here uh, there are two assays that were done. One was a, a single cell uh, electrophoresis, which is called the comet assay. Another was the uh, DNA diffusion assay. So bo in both of them, what we find is that the control and the NACs look very same. So that means uh, whatever damage is being done here is also maybe attributed to the presence of uh, ROS. And uh, uh, obviously the most damage was uh, shown by the positive control. So then we tried to find out whether autophagy has any role here. So we did three, sorry, uh, we did two experiments, uh, three experiments rather. So once we took the minimum concentration of uh, 
nanoparticle that we were using, uh, the 10 microgram per ml. And uh, here you can see that this is, I already showed you that uh, uh, the G GFP ATG8 experiments showed, show us that autophagy is switched on. And uh, DHE and DCF tests show us that this, yes, there is ROS production also. Uh, the Comet assay shows us that there is not much DNA damage. The DNA diffusion assay also confirmed that. So then we tried to switch off autophagy, right? So what we did was we used 3-methyladenine, which is an autophagy inhibitor. So here you can see, first in the first panel, we used the cerium oxide with 3-MA and uh, the minimum amount of cerium oxide with 3-MA. So here we, obviously there's no autophagy here. We find a huge amount of ROS accumulation and we find a huge amount of this. So this is how a beautiful comet looks like. The com you know the name comet. It comes from uh, these heavenly bodies which have a uh, head and they have this tail. So that's how this comet as it says. And all these trails are actually broken DNA. So the longer the tail of the comet, that will tell you the about the greater DNA damage. So you can see here that uh, if we inhibit autophagy, then ROS production overshoots and there is lots of DNA damage as well. Then what we did was we uh, made a set where we added 3MA and the 10 microgram per ml cerium oxide nanoparticle. And to that, we added 1 millimolar H2O2. So exogenous ROS was also added along with the minimum amount of endogenous ROS that is produced by the uh, cerium oxide. So here you can see that since th th there's nothing here, so there's no autophagy going on, huge amount of ROS is produced because there's exogenous ROS as well, right? So endogenous plus exogenous ROS, which is more than this, obviously. And you can see more DNA damage. So from here, we can argue we can say quite confidently that uh, cerium oxide induced genotoxicity can be controlled by autophagy. So uh, our, our experiment, uh, I mean, just summarizing, uh, I can go on and on, but just summarizing our experiment. Initially, when we treated with cerium oxide, uh, ROS was produced, a minimum amount of ROS was produced, which was needed for induction of autophagy. And uh, it kind of prevented DNA damage, gave the cell enough time to tide over the damage. We washed the cells and then we also we, we got its continued uh, growth. This cascade went on, but the plant cells managed to survive. Uh, so the survival was not affected. Antioxidants were overexpressed. ROS was kind of managed. Autophagy was switched on and that went on. But when we used 3-methyladenine um, uh, to repress autophagy, we found that under the same conditions, the cells were being pushed towards death. And uh, uh, that means that autophagy was essential for survival of this cell. So parallelly, what we did was, I, I showed you all these, but just uh, summarizing, parallelly, what, what, what we did was we used NAC. So NAC was a inhibitor of ROS. So we stopped the ROS cascade, or we tried to control the ROS cascade. So, but what we found here was the antioxidants were overexpressed here. They did not know what to do, right? But when we washed NAC off, what we found was that ROS was now back in full flow. It caused a lot of damage, da damage, and then it also took to cell death. So there, there was no way of controlling cell death, uh, and not bring an autophagy could not even be switched on. It was direct and immediate cell death. So this was a very beautiful uh, representation that there is a crosstalk between ROS and autophagy. ROS induces autophagy. Autophagy saves the cell from ROS-induced damage. And uh, but if you not if you do not let the ROS cascade work initially, later on it is not possible to manage ROS induced damages anymore. So we can argue that uh, cerium oxide nanoparticle induced autophagy is a ROS signal mechanism that recycles burnout organelles, prevents oxidative damage, and provides a safeguard against exogenous uh, H2O2. 
and we have repeated this work on a lot of other uh, nan with a lot of other nanoparticles as well and this is a representation where uh, we i i we are we have found that uh, you know autophagy is basically since it's a cell survival mechanism it is switched on at lower concentrations of the stress as the stress levels go higher and more and more ros is produced the autophagy cascade switches off and then the cell death cascades take over so this is a representation on the top panel you can see the gfp atg fusion protein so this is a nickel oxide nanoparticle at 10 62.5 and 125 mg uh, per ml uh, microgram per level of uh, this nanoparticle you can see formation of the autophagosomes but at higher concentrations you don't get it so parallelly when we investigated the presence of apoptosis and necrosis what we found was that this is a kit using three different dyes so the uh, the uh, the blue fluorescence was for the live cells the living cells so you can see as the concentration of the nanoparticle goes on the number of living cells go down the red cells are the hallmarks of apoptosis so you can see that in the intermediate concentrations apoptosis is setting in and if you notice here the cells which were showing autophagy are the ones which are still surviving the other cells are slowly dying out in the same clusters actually and then uh, if you look at the green cells these are the ones where uh, this is late apoptosis as well as necrosis so this uh, this is now our point of interest that what are the crucial switch uh, switch ons and switch offs of these three uh, cell death cascades uh, what is the cross talk between these three and uh, how is uh, how does a cell determine where to go so what we have uh, seen so far is that the uh, engineered nanoparticles can induce uh, stress damage uh, to cell organelles disrupt cell homeostasis and lead to ros induction ros accumulation increases with increase in the quantum of stress which is the concentration of the nanoparticle that we are using and that also increases dna damage and eventually leads to cell death at the highest concentrations and autophagy is induced in under the lower and median levels of uh, stress which uh, probably hits uh, which probably are the concentrations concentrations which are indeed the concentrations uh, whose exposures the plants can probably manage and we also found that ros upsurge is necessary necessary for induction of autophagy and uh, we know for sure that autophagy now um, helps the stress cells to survive and the survival cells are actually more resistant to recurrent stresses so what now why am i saying this whole story because at this point of time we are very interested uh, you know what we have done we humans have done is we have accelerated environmental change we are going through global warming we are going through a, a mass extinction episode and if we have to survive we have to ensure that the plants also survive with us uh, plants do are the best survivors but they serve, but their adaptation to particular stresses needs time and we don't have time so our hypothesis is that can we train the plants to resist stress by exposing them to lower levels of the stressors and in a way upregulating their autophagy cascade so can that bring in adaptive response so basically there's a primary response which causes some kind of a change but this uh, exposure is a sub threat sub threat level exposure so it does not kill the plant but it makes it uh you know uh, resistant uh, probably to uh, secondary tertiary exposures and uh, this is what we want to see that what is the sensing signaling and what are the genetic changes which are related to the adaptation of this plant to recurrent exposures of the particular stressor so the work is still on it is hardly finished and there are lots of other aspects which i could not talk of during the due to, due to time constraints and all but yeah it's a very interesting uh, aspect and we are very hopeful that uh, something can be done so uh, we have a uh, Uh, my i have a very beautiful working group lots of people are there i just name those who are working directly on this aspect so this is obhishek shadhu he is a uh, doctorate now he's in scripps institute in florida uh, this is shoykot all of you who are in uh, ac college know you know him and he's my phd student actually and indrani manna who who's just submitted her phd work and this is professor yuji moriyasu from saitama university he's the, he's the person who is the collaborator of 
Professor uh, Oshumi. Uh, so we are very lucky to get in touch with him. And uh, we, I also am very indebted to Professor Anita Mukherjee, who is an ex-professor of our department. She was my teacher also. And she is the one who brought me to the field of environmental nanotoxicology, which helped me uh, go into the field of autophagy as well. So um, thank you. Thank you for the patient uh, uh, hearing. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it's a very nice presentation. I think uh, autophagy became uh, one of the most interesting uh, topic over the last decade, especially uh, plant autophagy. Uh, I think uh, it's a time for uh, question answer session. Uh, if there is question, please. Any question? I think Shoikat, they can ask the questions to you also. So because I know you are, uh, you since you work on this topic, you are also very good, uh, would be very good in answering the questions. So we'll be, uh, we can go on answering and asking questions through you. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, there is no question more. Uh, now I. Uh, thank you so much, uh, ma'am, once again. Uh, we are at the end of this uh, today's session. Uh, before we, uh, there is a small announcement. Uh, there is a feedback form uh, link in the chat box. Uh, we would appreciate it if you would complete that and for provide your feedback. Uh, you will also get a, a receipt of certificate within a few days. Uh, now I would uh, like to request uh, one of our senior uh, colleagues. Uh, Mr. Ponovesh Mitro uh, to give vote of thanks. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everyone. I am honored and lucky to have the opportunity to give a vote of thanks on this occasion. Firstly, I want to thank the respected president of governing body of Krishna Chandra College, Mr. Noresh Chandra Baudi, and the principal of Krishna Chandra College, Dr. Gautam Chatterjee and members of advisory committee, Dr. Pallav Jatipal and Dr. Shamil Kumar Josh for participating and supporting this seminar. My heartfelt thanks to the valuable speakers, Dr. Moumita Bandopadhyay and Dr. Devabrata Laha for sharing your findings and opinion with us. I would like to thank all the faculty members of Department of Botany, Krishnachandra College, for organizing such excellent webinar. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants for making this event successful. Once again, thanks a lot to all. Shai Kutsa. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mitro. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us uh, to this uh, event. Uh, on the behalf of Convenart and organizing team, uh, I am uh, very uh, thankful to our respected principal and members of advisory committee, especially Dr. Pallav Jyotipal and Dr. Shamal Kumar Jos, whose constant uh, encouragement and wholehearted support uh, make this event come true. And I convey my heartiest grateful to all the members of uh, Department of Botany, Kishore Chandra College, uh, Pranavesha, Dr. Shathiti, uh, Samapti Di, Kakule Di, for their support and active participation. Um, Thank you so much once again. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, now I am uh, closing the webinar. Thank you so much.
সাথে জি হ্যাঁ সরকার প্লিজ সেভ দা রেকর্ডিং হ্যাঁ